Next, we will hear from Dr. Caitlin Kenny Walsh, Senior Director of Policy and Research at the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Foundation. We're so honored to have Dr. Kenny Walsh with us today. Thanks so much. Thanks for the opportunity to be with all of you today as part of today's webinar. It's wonderful to be with so many leaders from organizations that are doing such thoughtful and meaningful, impactful work in the behavioral health space. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. I had planned to talk through the agenda quickly, but I'm going to ask you to skip over again, just in the interest of time. Thank you. Next slide, please. Before I launch in, I just want to tell you a little bit about the foundation. Our mission is to ensure equitable access to health care for all those in Massachusetts who are economically, racially, culturally, or socially marginalized. The way we do our work is really through two arms. Um, I think of it as sort of our grant making arm, um, where we provide grants to both support programmatic interventions, support advocacy in advance of our mission, and also to provide general operating support. In our other arm of work, our policy and research arm, our aim is to develop nonpartisan, objective, educational materials, as well as analytic pieces with policy suggestions, all intended to advance our mission. Next slide, please. We organize our work really in three key focus areas which are depicted here. These three focus areas are coverage and care, behavioral health, which is the focus of my comments today, Um, and the report that I'll really be focusing in on, as well as structural racism and racial inequities in health. This latter one is one that we recently added in 2020. And while it is a separate focus area, we really try to embed a racial equity lens in all the work we do across all of our focus areas. Uh, next slide, please. So highlighted on this slide, next slide, please. I'll keep going just in the interest of time. Um, highlighted here is just a sampling of work we have done that is reinforced both from consumer perspectives and provider perspectives that a primary reason people can't get behavioral health services when they need them is our behavioral health workforce crisis. And notably, these data also suggest that the need for services and the challenges in accessing a provider who is considered a good fit is more pronounced among adults who are from marginalized communities. Um, that is those who are in groups other than non-Hispanic white and those who identify as LGBTQ individuals, very much in line with the comments and the data shared by my prior panel, by my uh, co-panelists. Um, in, in addition, um, there is good news. Uh, the good news in Mass, sorry, it's just a little disgruntled, uh, thrown off by the change in slides. On the good news front, in Massachusetts and in many other states, there's been a groundswell of movement towards behavioral health reform on the, both the policy and the funding fronts. Reform can't succeed without funding, and not just funding, but sustainable funding. Depict here are many of the state initiatives or financial resources that were aimed at or available to support behavioral health services or behavioral health workforce in Massachusetts. Um, I won't go through all of them, um, but the American Rescue Plan Act was a significant source of funding, um, dedicating over $400 million to the state's behavioral health system. Um, in Massachusetts, our state Medicaid program, known as MassHealth, included two provisions in its um, 1115 waiver extension dedicated to investment or repayment programs for the behavioral health workforce. Uh, next slide, please. At the same time, uh, one of the challenges we frequently heard is that those initiatives are not coordinated or organized according to a strategic approach for addressing the behavioral health workforce issues over the long term. It is within that backdrop that we commissioned the report that I'll focus on today. We conducted this work in collaboration with Manat Health intended to fill what we perceived as a gap in laying out a comprehensive strategy to address these problems and take advantage of opportunities in a coordinated way. Our project really had a multi-pronged approach. We included interviews with national and state experts in behavioral health, in workforce development, and or in diversity, equity, and inclusion. We conducted a lit review of organizations with expertise that have prioritized work in this area. We 
uh, conducted an inventory of behavioral health programs in Massachusetts and across the country, um, and where evidence existed, documented what we knew about the efficacy of those particular programs. We finally completed with a set of recommendations informed by these activities. Um, I won't go through this in detail right now, just given time, but I do want to point to the fact that we used this framework, which was published in a health affairs article, really to guide the development of our interview guide and the organization of our recommendations. That is to say, when you think about the behavioral health workforce and not only expanding the behavioral health workforce, but also promoting retention through resiliency and, it, and diversifying it, you really need to think about policies in each of these four quadrants, production, distribution, resilience, and maximizing potential. And while I won't categorize each of the recommendations that I'll discuss, uh, it was a key goal of ours to make sure that we were thinking through all of these key pillars as we developed recommendations. Um, next slide, please. Uh, on this slide are seven key recommendations um, that were developed as part of our report. Um, if you can go to the next slide again, please. Thank you. I won't, in the interest of time, go deep on all seven of these recommendations. What I will do is go deep on recommendations one, two, and four. But I do want to make sure I take a minute to address the remaining uh, recommendations three, five, six, and seven. Um, despite the Federal Mental Health Parity and Addiction Act, we know that insurance reimbursement rates are often low for covered behavioral health services as compared to physical health services. A 2017 Milliman study found that commercial insurers in Massachusetts provided reimbursement rates for primary care office visits that were almost 60% higher than reimbursement for comparable behavioral health office visits. We know that these disparities in reimbursement rates have cascading impacts that impact our behavioral health workforce. We re routinely heard in this work and in other work that pay is a critical factor determining many, deterring many people from entering the field or prompting shifts in sites of care where providers practice. That is in places where there are higher reimbursement rates, uh, there are opportunities for greater salaries. This often has deleterious impacts on community-based organizations that might work in more marginalized communities. Um, we also recommended a multi-pronged strategy to dramatically expand the paraprofessional workforce. Uh, paraprofessional workforce, as you can see here, is one that I'm um, representative of peers, community health workers, recovery specialists. And we think this workforce is critical to advancing health equity. I'm echoing some of the comments of Cleese and Randall. Um, these individuals belong to the community they serve. They're able to identify and share experience with clients with respect to race, ethnicity, culture, and language. And we really Really need to be uh, more ardent in developing policy solutions that support financial stability for these roles um, and that enhance the pathways for a career in these spaces. Uh, again, echoing a theme from one of my earlier panelists, we need to create a system of social supports for all members of the behavioral workforce. And this includes things that Randall mentioned around ensuring that we're supporting employees, providing service, uh, providing behavioral health service with uh, vicarious trauma, providing them the opportunity to prioritize self-care given the, what we know about burnout. And lastly, um, one of the recommendations was to fund an in-depth evaluation of the impact of telehealth on the behavioral health workforce. Um, prior to March 2020, we know that less than 1% of behavioral health services were delivered by telehealth. By August 2021, more than a third of behavioral health services were delivered by telehealth. Um, as Angela described, there are definitive benefits associated with telehealth. In addition to uh, some of the ones she mentioned, we also know that telehealth expanded access for people who live in rural communities. At the same time, we have heard of some adverse repercussions associated with the growth of telehealth. In particular, uh, we understand that telehealth has created an opportunity for the development of private companies, which might offer enhanced salaries and or better work-life balance for behavioral health providers, all good things for staff and for employees, but oftentimes one unintended consequence of this has been a loss of behavioral health workforce in other settings and often in settings where there are already exacerbated shortages for behavioral health providers. Um, next slide, please. 
I'm going to jump in now to a bit more of a detailed review of um, some of the other recommendations. The first one being conducting a baseline workforce needs assessment. Um, we have multiple views into the problem of behavioral health workforce crisis, but we really need a comprehensive understanding of the current state to identify gaps and build the pathway out. Um, I won't go through all of the recommendations pursuant to what we should include in this behavioral health workforce needs assessment. I will point to the fact that there are examples from the field, including from my colleagues at the Mullen Institute, around ways to kickstart this work. So it is doable, um, but it really needs needs to be a multidisciplinary uh, working group of individuals across um, health and human service agencies, the Department of Education, the Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development, as well as inclusive of people with lived experience from marginalized communities, um, to ensure that we have a sense of the prevalence and the risk of behavioral health conditions and some of the challenges that have been experienced, as well as an opportunity to leverage existing data sources and grow upon them. As, when, as was mentioned, we do have some data. However, much of that data lacks, for example, providers who might not be licensed professionals. We don't have a great deal of data on the peer workforce. And we also don't have a systematic way of collecting race, ethnicity, language, gender identity, other information that's really critical as we think about meeting the needs of our community writ large and also specifically communities that may have been marginalized. Next slide, please. Armed with information from a comprehensive needs assessment and mindful of the initiatives that might be at play, both from a federal perspective and a state perspective, the next recommendation is to develop and fund, again, fund a 10-year strategy for growing the behavioral health workforce. There are really three critical ways in which we're thinking about this strategy. And again, some of these echo comments of my prior panelists. You know, we really need to minimize bar financial barriers to entry. I won't go into the data, but there is specific data that's available from 2020 nationally indicating that people entering um, social work programs enter with significant burden of debt. And that burden of debt is greater for individuals who are black than for individuals who are white and greater for individuals who identify as Hispanic as compared to individuals who don't identify as Hispanic. If we wanna diversify our workforce, we need to address these issues generally and specifically in thinking about inequities facing communities of color. We recommend in our report that the state work with colleges and universities to develop scholarship opportunities as opposed to you know, loan repayment or grant programs, but scholarship opportunities that mitigate sort of the entry level barrier to following in the behavioral health workforce track. We also think we really need to think about encouraging interest in this field. There are some really interesting um, examples of across the country. For example, in Montana, their AHEC offers a heads up behavioral health camp to expose high school students to careers in behavioral health. Um, other ideas for sort of garnering this interest and um, Exposure might be offering training to students in mental health first aid, training on suicide or training on anti-bullying as initial programs to generate exposure, awareness, and identify people who might otherwise be interested in this field and not know much about it. Uh, lastly, we need to continue to monitor strategies to address the maldistribution of providers. And when I say maldistribution of providers, I mean it comprehensively not just geographically, but also in terms of provider type, in terms of providers that are, you know, working full time, in terms of thinking about the representation of providers by race, ethnicity, language, um, cultural affinity. Um, so really thinking about a, a comprehensive uh, uh, strategy that will last over the long term, be enduring, and be updated in the context of what other federal and state policies are emerging. Uh, next slide, please. Our last recommendation is to establish a behavioral health workforce center. A behavioral health workforce center could be responsible for all of the prior recommendations, but the really the goal here is to have a centralized, systematized entity that's responsible permanently for moving forward with the behavioral health strategy um, to serve as the central hub that can be mindful of uh, taking note of evaluating behavioral health interventions 
interventions that are proving effective or not as a mechanism to continue to share best practices to serve as a resource um, you know as funders as policymakers seek to deploy new policies or investments as a entity that can provide guidance on those um, interventions that have been proven as the most effective and also to similarly provide on the ground TA for organizations seeking to implement behavioral health interventions or practices. Um, next slide, please. So many of the recommendations that I summarized and again did so quickly in an effort to try and keep some time here are ones that will need to be implemented over the long term. So what do we do in the short term? You know, wh where do we go from here? Um, the foundation has recently implemented a grant program uh, that we're calling Advancing Community Driven Mental Health. This grant program is one that leverages the Problem Management Plus model instituted by the World Health Organization, largely in under-resourced countries. Um, and it's a really a program that intends to equip lay uh, non-clinical people with basic skills to help their community members manage everyday stress, adversity, um, and to equip them with strategies to address those challenges. Um, the, the benefit that we see in the short term is creating a community workforce that looks like the community serve, that is therefore approachable, that speaks their language, and that is armed with skills to help individuals mitigate some of the mental health or behavioral health, mental health challenges that they may be experiencing. Ideally, this helps to reduce um, potential acute behavioral health conditions and mitigate, you know, pressure on the behavioral health care system uh, providers who might need to be available for, you know, more acute behavioral health or mental health conditions. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap it up to leave at least a little time. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Dr. Kenny Walsh, for sharing um, all your work in Massachusetts to grow diversity and capacity of the workforce.